Amen. I'd like to say greetings again to you today. Uh, Sunday the 3rd of May. God bless each and every one of you. We are here again to lift up the name of Jesus and to uh, call on uh, the Spirit of God to move on this place, even under this pandemic that we're dealing with. Uh, folk have gotten a bit anxious, and uh, I, I like to warn the people to be careful. Uh, I know everybody wants to get out and get back to the way it used to be, of which I don't think we ever will. But I believe that we need to just be prayerful and cautious and uh, keep our eyes on the figures, you know, the statistics of what's happening, even as people begin to interact and move around and what have you. Amen. I want to, uh, first of all, go to the Lord in prayer before we bring the message. We ask that you would just pray with us. Let us go. Lord God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. Lord, we thank you for another day's journey, another week, Lord, that you saw fit to leave us here and to be with us through this, 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 this plague that plagues our land and even our world. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just bless us to continue to stay close, Lord, uh, uh, that we would continue to nurture the relationship you extend to each of us, as Isaiah tells us, that your hand is stretched out still. Oh, God, there are some that we want to lift up in, uh, to you today, Joe LaRue, Lord, our brother in Christ in Chicago, who uh, has been diagnosed <clears throat> with uh, kidney disease now from this coronavirus. Oh, God, we pray that you be with him. Joe is up in age, 94, 95 years old, something to that effect. We ask a blessing on him and his family. Even now, Lord, we pray that you just uh, stretch forth your hand, if it be according to your holy and righteous will, and bring about healing and miracle, Lord, for the doctors are saying there's only a few days left for them. But God, we know you're able. Oh, Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world, Lord, that are fighting the fight of faith. Lord, we pray for those on mission fields, those uh, on foreign fields, as well as those domestic. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and shut in. Lord, we pray for those behind prison bars. Lord, we Oh, God, we just ask that you would just continue to have your way in our lives, Lord, that you continue to touch and, and, and move on all of us. Lord, we want to ask that you put a hedge around the children. Oh, God, that you would bless them, Lord, that you would keep them, Lord. Oh, Father, we just thank you for all that you do. We count it a blessing. And, Lord, you have our attention, Lord. And so now we ask that you would just continue to... Uh, infuse us with the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you impart to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless us and keep us as our prayer. Go with me now, Lord, as I go into your word, and we be so sure to give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to give another song. Uh, uh, before we get any further uh, into the service. Oh, 
word for this week will come from the 46th number of the Psalms, Psalms 46 and verse 10, which says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And my thought for today is, be still, God reigns. Most scholars believe this psalm was composed in the aftermath of God's delivering the Israelites from the Assyrians, uh, Sennacherib, who was their leader at the time, his army. Uh, this deliverance occurred after the siege of Jerusalem that ended when the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, took its starting point from this mighty moving Hebrew song that proclaims the sufficiency of God for the crisis of life. Is your relationship with God through Christ sufficient? That's a good question. Because each of us has to ask that question as we have had time to ponder. This robust psalm, defiant of God's enemies, moved beyond the local situation that may have inspired it to universal principles. Its great value, however, is the word it speaks to individuals to have faith in God's protecting hand and ample resources. It proclaims the ascendancy of God in three areas. That God has power over the forces of nature, according to Psalms 46, 1 through 3. Because communication technology is so advanced, news of earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, and other tragedies reach our ears instantly uh, because of the internet and other news sources. 
We live in the face of grim reality, often seeing innocent people victimized by these terrible events. Yet God has ultimate control of these forces. He limits them, allowing them to go only so far and no further. The important fact is that with God in our hearts, we can face even the possibility of world catastrophe with firm faith. Sometimes he spares his children, but sometimes they too must suffer or even die. Also being known as a casualty of war. But as illustrated in the synoptic gospels of Jesus, uh, calming the tempest um, in Mar and Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel, when nature seems to rage, we must be confident that God's got this, that he's in charge, that when the storms of our lives are raging, we must have the same confidence to know that I must be still and allow God to handle it. God's children must not surrender their faith when they confront a tragedy they cannot understand or explain. For every person will at some time have an experience in which all the elements seem to combine to overwhelm them. We must learn with God's help to endure with dogged uh, persistency. Continue faith will produce courage. And God controls this world and will never turn it over to evil or chance. Secondly, God has power over those who attack his strongholds, according to verses 4 through 7 in this psalm. For these verses refer to the city of Jerusalem, God's citadel, where his temple was. God, through his creative power, supplied all that the city of Jerusalem needs. No matter what the trouble, their joy would force out their troubles. In it were the religious symbols that had served as a unifying force for the nation. Though they have their shortcomings, the institutions of religious faith are still important. They contain the depository of religious customs through the centuries, for God protects his citadel. Though the nations may rise up against her, God merely raises his voice and the nations of the earth melt. When some phase of institutional life needs to be destroyed, God is equal to the occasion. For when, however, it needs only to be corrected and then protected, he is also equal to the task. It's good to know God is our shield and buckler. God protects his word, the Bible, for no matter what the skeptics may say, how they may doubt, God is the sentinel of his word. I know amen go right about there. For Jesus said not one jot or tittle will go unnoticed until all be fulfilled. How else can one uh, explain its existence when so many have sought to destroy it throughout the centuries? God's people need to trust him, continuing to believe in the integrity of his word. God has control over the whole warring world. But what does a Christian do when he or she sees the nations of the world moving toward what seems to be an inevitable war that will bring universal destruction to the human race? The Christians praise. You may ask why? The psalmist says in verse 9 that he makes wars to cease. And of course, this is true. Yet wars continue to arise. Christians must realize peace can come only when people have peace in their hearts. And this comes only through a close relationship with Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Thus, when we take the message of Jesus to the lost, we are doing the one thing that must have priority in all our service. We must, however, cooperate with all those who are seeking to promote peace, 
as long as we can do so without compromising our Christian convictions. And finally, we must live with an attitude of trust, doing all that we can do, but leaving the rest in God's hands. This is what the Lord meant when he said through the psalmist, be still and know that I am God in that verse, in that 10th verse. And so in closing, my brothers and my sisters, when the psalmist said, be still, he was in a sense speaking comfort to the harassed, but he had another audience in mind. His message was for the restless and turbulent world. His statement was more than mere assurance to God's people. He wanted to make it clear that God's glory would be manifested. When the forces of evil have done everything they can to oppose God, God will stand victorious. For when the enemies thought Jesus was through, when they mistried him, when they nailed him, when they placed him on the cross between heaven and earth and thought that all was done, that God was defeated, that death was the victor, then God did what only God can do. He ordered death itself to hold on and ordered the grave to shut its mouth. He then raised our Lord from the grasp of death and he reclaimed the Christ. Like the songwriter declared, Ride on, King Jesus. No man cannot hinder you. Since this is true, his people can rejoice and be happy. And even though this coronavirus uh, has, has taken many lives and many have come down with, the, with the, the virus in their bodies, still many are coming out of that virus. And that virus is not the victor for many. And so, my brothers and sisters, rejoice and be happy. God's got this. We don't have to worry. For if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. God bless you this week. And I pray that God will be with you through all that you're going through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen.